I'm sharing just on how to prepare for war <laughs> because I believe that's what it's about. The church has been called to two extremes. The one is to pastor, to bring comfort and healing. And the other part is to, is to war. And so I'm speaking more on the other part. And all of us need to be aware that the times that we're living in are really crazy times. And the words that Jesus spoke in Matthew 24 about what was to happen as we see the wars and rumors of wars, as we see ethnic groups against ethnic groups, as we got the news during the week also of the wars that are raging now in northern Ethiopia, we better start believing that there are signs that the world is changing and the world is not desperate for religious church members. The world is desperate for the sons and daughters of God to begin manifesting and to begin walking out a life that is completely different to Sunday to Sunday. So when I look at what has happened historically, we find that when it comes to the end times, the rapture and the tribulation and the church, that there's very little agreement on all of these things. And we tend to just choose those things that we're comfortable with. And globally speaking, generally speaking, we've been teaching and hearing so much about the good stuff, the nice stuff, the comfortable stuff, that we have failed to actually warn believers about the days that we'll be living in. In fact, I believe that the majority of Christians hope that they get taken out before those days come. And so you can form comfortable theologies about that. And the issue with that is <clears throat> that the moment that you start walking through difficulties, you wonder why nobody warned you. Or you maybe have so indulged yourself in the comfortable theologies that you say, well, you know, obviously if I can't believe the comfortable stories, then God can't be real. And Jesus warned us about that. In Matthew 24, he actually said that the love of most will grow cold. So if you're a son and daughter of God today, just hear that and be aware of that because we do have a task to encourage one another and to in a sense, force one another into intimacy with God and staying in those places, you know, where we can receive what we need for the time in which we're living. The beheading of Christians is now a daily event. We received the news during the week and the governments of those countries seem to want to deny the truth even though it's out on news media and well as the video clips can be seen in northern Mozambique more than 50 Christians have been beheaded because of their faith that's Mozambique that's our neighbor to the north I don't know how that makes you feel it's not intended to make you feel fearful it's intended to motivate you to to be able to begin strong in your faith and to be able to stand. And one of the things that we need to you know, become aware of is that the Bible never leaves us in doubt as to what is going to happen. But let me give you an example of a very comfortable scripture and then put a context to it. Are you okay with that? 
Okay, so I'm going to take you to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. How many of you heard about 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18? Some of you nodding your heads because you've talked about it, you've preached about it. And this is what it says. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And we've shared quite a lot about what Jesus did when he was made alive in his spirit, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, he went down into Sheol to make a declaration. I just want to sketch this picture for you once again. And in Sheol, there were two places according to Luke chapter 16 when Jesus was teaching on this. In the one area called Hades, all the unbelieving dead were kept. They were in a place of waiting. In the other area, which was so removed from Hades called Abram's bosom that nobody could go from one to the other or from the other to the one. In Abram's bosom, all of those who believed in God were in a place of waiting. But when Jesus was crucified, dead and buried, Peter said he was made alive in the spirit and he went to make declaration. He meant to go and say it is finished. This is what's gonna happen from now onwards. The book of Revelation said that he has in his hands the keys of death and hell. That means that he took back the authority that was granted to the devil in the Garden of Eden. He took it back and changed everything. How did he change it? Well, he went into Hades and made a declaration. According to John chapter 8, he went down there. You see, Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees that Abram saw my day and believed. He saw my day. A day was about to start. So when Jesus paid the full price for the sins of the world, both past, present, and future, he went down into Sheol and made a declaration, that day has begun in me. The day that you who are unbelieving dead did not want to come about, has come about. You will be bound up until you stand before the white throne judgment one day. And then he went into Abram's bosom. And in Abram's bosom, he declared the day that you were waiting for. The day of the final sacrifice. The sacrifices that have been taken place from the Garden of Eden to this day pointed towards my day. The day that I'm declaring you now, the day that that final sacrifice has been made, I have made it and I've come to take captivity captive according to Ephesians 4. He took all of those who were in Abram's bosom and rose on the third day. <laughs> what was interesting, if you read in Matthew chapter 28, I call it the resurrection bus. Because in my day, you used to ride bus and if you wanted to stop, you press the bell, ting, ting, it went ting, ting like that. And um, some of them said, we just want to go walk about a little bit before we go with you. And he must have just sort of said, okay, you know, we'll wait for a while. And Matthew 28 said that they saw some of the dead walking around in Jerusalem. And then Jesus takes them up with the sacrifice that he has made to the temple, not built with hands, to present before the Father the full sacrifice that he had made and those that had been waiting for that day. You see, when Jesus went to make that declaration, the whole of the universe changed. There was now no place of waiting for the believer. Now it became also for the unbeliever. Now it became a place that you're sentenced to. 
If you die in unbelief, the writer to the Hebrew says, it's allotted unto man once to die and then follows the judgment. If we don't make that decision in this life, that's what's waiting for us, bound up in Hades, waiting for the final judgment from where we'll be cast into the lake of fire. It's our decision. But it changed totally for the believers because from that time onwards, if anyone died, just like Abram's bosom was taken straight into the presence of God, just so that when anyone of us who are in Christ Jesus died, we go straight to be with the Father, no more place awaiting. Jesus said to that criminal on the cross with him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Stephen, when Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7, he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus standing, waiting to welcome him. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. In fact, he makes a big thing about it in the book of Philippians chapter 1 where he says, it's actually better for me to go. I really want to go, but God has me here still for a purpose, so I'll fulfill the purpose that God has for me here in this world, and then I'll go because I know I'll be with him. Amen? The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is powerful. And that resurrection, Jesus was called the last Adam, but the second man. Because when he came, he was the second person that came into this world sinless. Adam was the first. Jesus was the last. It's not going to happen again. Jesus paid the price as a sinless lamb of God. He paid the full price. It's never going to happen again. And when he rose from the dead, he began what the New Testament calls the first resurrection. So <laughs> this is the wonderful thing. You know, that, that until what Thessalonians speaks about here in 1 Thessalonians 4, anyone who dies in faith goes straight to be with him. And what Thessalonians is speaking about is that day when the first res resurrection comes to a conclusion. You know, when all those who have gone, Hebrews chapter 12 speaks about just men being made perfect. When we gather together, we've come to the mountain of God. We've come to just men made perfect when all of those who have gone and all of us who are left alive, we're all gonna be gathered together with him. Yay! Come on, somebody say yay. <coughs> it is the culmination of the first resurrection. You don't wanna be part of the second resurrection. You don't want to be part of what's going to happen when those who are being held in Hades have to come and stand before the white throne judgment. That's the second resurrection. You want to be part of the first resurrection. But you see, we've focused so much on 1 Thessalonians 4 that some people have gone to sit at the bus stop waiting for this to happen. Some people have built the theology, you know, nothing bad is going to happen to me because God will take me out of this before anything bad starts happening. And so I want to sketch context for you. Is that okay? <laughs> Some of you are a bit apprehensive now. But you see, Paul goes on speaking about this in 2 Thessalonians. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 speaks about this. He then goes on in chapter 5 to speak about the circumstances that surround this. And then in 2 Thessalonians, he says the following. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. <coughs> You know, he's speaking in a way that all of us should understand. But let me just explain this. You see, Jesus said, whoever believes in him has passed out of judgment into life. <clears throat> he says that we are already living in eternity. We are citizens both of the kingdom of heaven and of this country of ours here in South Africa, dual citizenship. But we've already, we've already passed into eternal life. Remember as he stood at the tomb of Lazarus and the, you know, the sisters were talking to him. He said, 
I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. And he who lives in me will never die. And so when he's speaking, he's speaking in that context. And by our gathering together unto him, we are in him. If we die, we just step through this reality into the reality of eternity that we've already been experiencing. But much better so. <clears throat> and so Paul here warns the church not to worry. He tells them things that must first happen before Jesus comes. And so he goes on in verse 2 and 3. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. As that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Remember Matthew 24? We'll have people that come along and say that the Christ is here, the Christ is there. Go here, go there. Don't be deceived. Let no man deceive you by any means. For the day shall not come except there come a falling away first. The love of most will grow cold. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And so here Paul is once again speaking about that day that will culminate in the trumpet sounding, the archangel shouting and Jesus coming to fetch us. But he goes on to say the son of perdition, the man of sin must be revealed first. I'm asking you this morning, has he been revealed yet? Who is this man of sin? It goes on to say, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. That thing must happen still. So good management skills would be prepare for the long haul, prepare for what could happen while believing for the good. Prepare yourself, prepare your heart, prepare your life. Be able to be strong in the face of criticism, in the face of opposition, in the face of people mocking you for your faith, in the face of having to maybe face giving your life. Ultimately, so I want to draw your attention to some verses in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And again, it relates to what I'm sharing this morning preparing yourself. So the book of Revelation is like the book of Daniel. It's an apocalyptic book. It speaks about all kinds of things that are happening and it's written in a language that you've got to decipher. Now you have to decide hermeneutically. That means as you interpret scripture, you've got to decide in these books whether you're going to interpret it literally or whether you're going to interpret it metaphorically. Literally, it will be just what is written there. Metaphorically will be picture language like Deadsman gave us a picture this morning and we've got to apply that picture in the same way when you read Daniel and when you read the book of Revelation, what is the picture and what is the picture saying? But there are many people that mix their tala. They, they speak one thing and then it doesn't fit into what they want to believe and so they change the way that they interpret. Let me give you an example the numbers that are, book, are used in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation talks about 144,000 being saved. Only 144,000. <coughs> I see some of you are smiling. Because you know that the book of Revelation also talks about millions upon millions from every tribe, tongue, and nation standing before God and worshiping that's an amazing picture, right? From every tribe, tongue, and nation. But it speaks about 144,000. 
And so you've got to interpret that either literally and say, well, you know, I better work hard that I make, make the 144,000. Or otherwise, you've got to try and understand. So every time their numbers are used, this is my metaphoric interpretation of that. Every time that you see 10 times 10 times 10, 10 cubed, you're talking about something that is perfect. And when you see the 144, uh, when you see the number 144, it is actually 12 times 12. So it is the Old Testament saints, 12 times 12, the New Testament saints, multiplied by 10 by 10 by 10, which is a perfect number, which means that God knows when the perfect number comes in because he knows the end from the beginning. And it's given as a metaphorical picture for the number 144,000. <clears> but now I have a problem. Because the same people that believe that, believe that in the book of Revelation chapter 20, it speaks about a thousand years and they want to take that literally. And they speak about the millennium. Whoa, I see my wife's getting the jitters here now. <laughs> Throw the tomatoes my way, okay? Leave my wife out of it. <laughs> so let me read what it says in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> Will you allow me to do that? It says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. So the souls of those who'd been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God, they had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So metaphorically, you have 10 times 10 times 10. It's an exact period of time. It's a complete period of time, but we don't know how many years. In my understanding, it's already been 2,020 years. Why do I say that? Because you see, in the description that it's giving here, it says that they reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. So in this time of the first resurrection, from the moment that Jesus rose from the dead, as the firstborn from the dead, as the one who started the first resurrection and took those thousands, maybe millions of people with him out of Abram's bosom that continued. And as we die, we continue the first resurrection. So we come to the end of that first resurrection. That time period is called the first resurrection. And the book of Revelation says we'll reign with Jesus for the thousand years. Daniel 7 says the same. And in that thousand years, there will be opposition. There will be trouble. We, we need to make sure that we are able to stand by faith. Whatever the pr problems are that we're facing, whatever the issues are that we're facing, so are we people that are preparing ourselves, both in intimacy with God, in what we believe the scripture is saying to us, so that we don't find ourselves saying, well, you know, I can't believe the Bible because the Bible lies to me. But are we also preparing ourselves practically? Because if we hear what 
the world order is beginning to say and the way it is pushing governments in certain directions, ours included, do we really know how to grow our own food? Do we really know how to find our own water? Do we really know how to help our neighbor? I wanna say to you today, do we really understand the power of the resurrection in our lives? The resurrection of Jesus Christ in our life does mean forgiveness because when he rose from the dead, it was to tell us that the sacrifice that he had made was acceptable to the Father. He had paid the price and to as many as believed in him, he gave the right to be forgiven, be brought into the family of God and be reconciled with God forever and ever. But it also meant that in this life, we can live in such a way that we don't have to fear death, that we don't have to fear the circumstances around about us. When we have a look at what happens in the book of Acts, I believe that we need to come back to this place because in the book of Acts, the thing that really disturbed the demons of the people in that time is they kept on teaching about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We walk around and we just soft soap the gospel. We should be telling people, you know, Jesus rose from the dead and there is a death that we've got to face one day. Which side are we gonna be on, hell or heaven? And let's start disturbing the demons. See, the devil believes that he's not saved. And we can be talking about all kinds of things which the demons don't mind. But if we start touching on the nerve of bringing people to a place of passionate, personal relationship with Almighty God who are able to stand that even if their life is required of them. The allegation about the Christians is that we are so comfortable There's another world religion that says we are quite prepared to give our lives for what we believe in. And yes, they do crazy things like blowing themselves up and other people with them, beheading people and all that. They do crazy things, but the accusation is there. Are we prepared? Are we equipped? Are we close enough to God to understand that we don't have to be scared? We can speak out and the story that we speak out will begin to disrupt the demonic realm and we will see manifestations like we've never seen before. Because in that darkness, your light will shine. In that darkness, there will be signs, wonders and miracles taking place. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead needs to be central in our understanding, be central in our equipping It is the cornerstone of our Christianity. Romans chapter 10, believe in your heart. Well, it starts off by saying, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 10 verse nine, and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, you will be saved. I've got a lot more to say about the resurrection. But I believe God wants to touch people's lives, not just listen to words that I speak. But let me link it to some words that are really important to you. What is the importance of Jesus' resurrection for you and me? Then I'm gonna end. Philippians chapter three, verse 10. Philippians chapter three, verse 10 says more than this, but I want us just to pause here that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Father, as we pause this morning and discern your presence with us, I ask in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would help each one of us to know you and the power of your resurrection.
Would you bring revelation right now into our lives? Would you fill our spirit and our heart with the power of the resurrection? Would you start a fire in us, Lord, that can never be quenched? Would you give us words that would just bubble out of our mouth about the fact that there is a resurrection from the dead and there is life after death and that it's based on what Jesus did for us? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, it says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead well in you and me, that same spirit will give life to you. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life in all of its fullness. And so if just believing in Jesus hasn't done it for you, then believe in his resurrection. Believe in the power that God demonstrated in accepting that sacrifice, raising him from the dead, rocking the world from B.C. to A.D., splitting heaven and hell forever and ever and become part of that power of life that could flow through you and touch many people around about you. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you have believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purpose, purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit of promise has sealed us into our inheritance until the end and culmination of the first resurrection. You know what I believe, and this isn't, maybe theologically sound, but I believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit gives us a taste. It gives us a taste of what the resurrection is going to be like. It gives us a taste of what the power of God is all about. And so I pray that you would be being filled with the Holy Spirit, that that power would be refreshed and renewed in you right now that you would have a sense of incredible destiny and purpose because this life is not our home. We're just passing through. But while we're here, may the light and the life and the power of the resurrected Lord Jesus pour out of us and touch people, disturb demons. <laughs> Devil, you are defeated. Jesus cried out, it is finished. It still sounds throughout eternity. Those words will sound, tetelestai, it is finished. You are done. The only authority that you can get is what we as human beings would voluntarily give you, and we don't want to volunteer any authority to you. We want the kingdom of God to come and his will to be done on this earth now as it's being done in heaven. And devil, you are defeated. Amen, in Jesus' name. Amen, won't you please stand?